we provide unparalleled service. It's about building a reputation for that. It's not about the one-off amazing experience everyone's going to talk about for a week. It's about the reputation of consistent greatness. Welcome to Your Intended Message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, one-to-few, or one-to-many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one-to-self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Zach Garside. Here's three facts that I think you should know about Zach. One, he became the CEO of Power Selling Pros at 27 years of age by simply asking the founder to make him CEO. Two, Zach speaks on stages all over the United States, teaching business owners how to grow their business through the power of customer service. And three, Zach's favorite pastime is playing catch. He could stand on a patch of grass and play catch with you all day long. I don't know if I could do it that long, but I could do for for a short while with you anyways. Zach Garside, welcome to your intended message. Thank you for the absolutely beautiful introduction, George. My pleasure. Delighted to be talking with you. And you focus on customer service. Where do you see the opportunity for people to improve the customer service? And, and the two-part question, especially, how do they stay ahead of automated customer service? Uh, what a brilliant question. Opportunity-wise, I'll tell you a story. I frequently, I guess this isn't so much a singular story as a recurring story, but when I'm selling a business on the need for great customer service, I do one thing and one thing only. I pick up the phone and I call their competition with them there in the room. And I will ask their competition a frequently asked question just to show how great the opportunity is there. Most businesses provide quite poor service, especially on the phone, uh, which is a huge differentiating factor for any business that wants to take it seriously. I tell companies, you can be a little bit better than your competition on things like price, service, marketing, sales. But there's only one area where you can be 10 times better than all of the competition, and that is customer service. It's the only thing that you have full control over how good you are at it. Everything else depends significantly on customer reactions, market conditions. But if you want to be amazing at customer service and you want all of your customers to tell their friends and family about you, the opportunity is right there. It it doesn't cost you anything more. It doesn't require a significant investment of money. It just requires a different attitude and different behavior than you're currently displaying. That's the first part. And in regards to automated customer service, uh, staying on top of it is we, you, have to, you have to know what customer service is for. I think that the rise of artificial intelligence and automated customer service tools is revealing to us that we don't actually know what customer service is for. But back in the 80s and 90s, when the 1-800 number was new, Customer service was like magic. The fact that you could pick up the phone, dial a number, and somebody, some human would answer and take care of you, help you do business, ship your package. It was like literal magic. But then spam callers got into the game. Companies started optimizing for uh, cutting costs and being more efficient. So they introduced the dial tree, you know, press one for this, press two for that, press pound to speak to a representative. And what do we all do? Hit pound. (laughs) We murder the pound button. (laughs) Like, please let me talk to a person. Customer service is not a processing mechanism by which we just quickly get people through the system. That's what automation will help you do faster. But customer service is supposed to be magic. It's supposed to be a way to connect with the customer and make them feel something. And if you see it that way, you won't look at automation or artificial intelligence like it's here to 
replace you. You will look at it as a tool that you can use to help you. And that's how I think companies can stay on top of it is by simply having the mindset that, oh, this is exciting. I have a new tool at my disposal to help me wow the customer as opposed to, oh no, something that's here to replace me and and do the efficient parts of my job better than me. Because if that's your mindset, then your days are numbered. And Zach, you said earlier that you sit down with a prospect and you call their competition. What tends to surprise your prospect when you do that? The fact that they are not so different from their competition as they think. Because everybody wants to believe that they are different, that they are somehow unique from everybody else that does what they do. Uh, When somebody gets into our coaching program with us, they frequently ask, how are you going to make this relevant for me personally? How are you going to adapt this to my unique situation? And while we adapt coaching to every person we work with, the fact is most companies are not that different from their competition. Uh, Genuinely, I don't say that to be insulting. I I say that to simply state the facts. Uh, Most companies are very, very similar to other companies who do what they do. And so when a, when a customer calls a heating and air business and says, I'm just looking for an estimate, that company will think, oh, well, we are so much more expensive than all of our competition. So that's why they didn't do business with us. Or we are much cheaper than our competition. That's why they do work with us. But I call the competition and I ask, how much do you guys charge? And it's pretty much the same thing. And then I'll cut another company and it's basically the same price. And with the schedule, how soon can you get out to my house? If you're busy, uh, turns out other reputable companies in your area are also very busy. So the customer is not picking you based on the factors you think that they are. They're looking for the company that understands them best, treats them the best, makes them feel taken care of. And that surprises companies because they thought we're different, but turns out, They're not that different. And what are some of the first steps you suggest that they can do to be different? Step number one, and there are three. Step number one is you have to see your customer service people as the voice of the company. Stephen R. Covey once said that the way we see the problem is the problem. Therefore, you need to see your customer service people as the voice of the company. When I ask most customer service people, what is your job? Can you guess what they say? Um, Serving customers. I wish they said that. That would be a great response. (laughs) What they usually say is, I just answer the phones. Mm. Mm. And that's a terrible way to look at your career. Mm. I just, anytime the word just is included in the sentence, we have a problem. (laughs) They say, I just answer the phones. And if that's their perception, well, no wonder they're not doing a very good job. I can't, I can't imagine anybody who believes they just do something for a living being particularly good at it. So you've got to start by changing the perception. You've got to treat them well. I remember working in a customer service job several years ago and the sales team, right? Oh, the sales team had a meeting in the back of the building. This is why I eventually got into sales because I wanted to be treated like this. The manager of the sales team rolled this cart with smoothies and chocolate and fruit and acai bowls to the sales meeting. And they had a great time. You know, everybody's laughing. They're in there for a couple hours. And as they come out, right? Meanwhile, in the customer service department, we're getting yelled at if the music's above like a one out of 10 on the volume scale. After their meeting, the manager wheels the leftover snacks from the meeting to the customer service department. And my coworkers get excited and start reaching for it. And I'm like slapping wrists, you know, like, don't you take their leftovers. We're not dogs, right? We, we train another company that does a similar thing. Uh, we met with the managers. The managers had all these donuts brought in for their meeting, fresh donuts. And one of my trainers asked them, can I guess where the leftover donuts are going? And they all proudly say, yeah, to the customer service department. 
And he said, of course, because you wouldn't get them fresh donuts. You'd only send them the leftovers. So that's number one, is you got to change the perception. You've got to treat them like the voice of the company or they'll never act like it. The second thing is you've got to embrace the fundamentals, the, the solid first principles of great customer service. Uh, everybody wants a script or a complicated process, but that's not what you need. You need solid fundamentals, just basic principles of great service. If I walk into a call center and they have a binder filled with scripts, I know I'm dealing with a less than ideal situation. Because if your team saw themselves as the voice of the company and they were trained in the fundamentals of amazing service, they would do a great job just of their own accord. You know, they don't need complicated scripting and all these processes and steps to guide them. Plus, they're never going to look at the binder anyway. And then the final thing is you have to hold them accountable. When it says this call may be recorded for quality assurance, you got to use those calls for quality assurance. You've got to meet with your people on a regular basis to see how they're doing, to help them grow, to teach them and coach them. Uh, far too many, you'd be surprised how many companies record their calls for quality assurance and never do anything with them. They just sit there forever because one of two reasons, they're too busy or the manager doesn't want to listen to them. <laughs> they're like, I can't do that to myself. I don't want to hear those things. So those are my three pieces of advice. See them as the voice of the company, embrace the fundamentals and consistently hold them accountable to greatness. Mm. And and it's curious about the recording. I, I remember one time I was talking to a customer service person and and that message came on about the recording at the beginning. And I, and I asked him, I said, oh, by the way, when was the last time you listened to one of your calls? <laughs> and the person said, oh, well, I don't have to because there's been no problems. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Oh, that breaks my heart. Wow. What a what a great question on your part, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't, you know, they, they say that message, just call them maybe recorded for training purposes, you know, and, and I think it's a lie. <laughs> I think the only reason they say that is to keep me from getting angry <laughs> yeah. because it's, I'm being recorded. So don't say anything I'll regret. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think oh that's my the gosh. purpose. That is hilarious. It's a defense mechanism, right? The the companies are so paranoid of what might happen on the phone that they feel they have to hedge themselves against any danger or, or wrongdoing by this call may be recorded or we care about your service. We, your call is very important to us, even though all of the actual behavior is telling you exactly the opposite of those things. And and I recall too, um, Checking out, do, going through the self checkout at a store uh, a while ago, and and there's a little mess. You know, it tells you, pay. You know, how many bags you got. You know, pay here and that. And then the message comes on at the end. It says, um, "How was our service today?" And I'm thinking, I did all the work. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did nothing. <laughs> Have you? Uh, what airline do you fly? Um, uh, Air Canada. Okay, so I fly Delta. And Southwest Airlines used to be the golden child of customer service in the airline industry. This is no longer the case. Delta, in, in my opinion, at least, has taken that spot. Ah. If you call, I mean, Delta is really great at customer service. Uh, if you call a Delta customer service representative to get help, after the call ends, it will ask you one question. And I love this question. Because this is helping them, I think. The question is, on a scale of one to five, if you owned a business, how likely are you to hire the person you just talked to? Oh, wow. Press, what press five question. for yes and one for no. Amazing question. Be and now they're taking that feedback, which is so much better than on a scale of one to 10, how, how, well, how good was our service, right? How likely are you to hire the person who just helped you? and you take that feedback back to your team, that's motivating mm. because that is a direct reflection of the type of service you provided. Last time I called Delta, I couldn't book a flight online for some reason. It wasn't working. So I called them. This representative was so positive, so kind, 
And she found that I had like $700 worth of e-credits in my account that I didn't even know were there. She finds it. She, she applies it for me. She said something was broken and went and brought somebody else to get involved. I just, I felt like she really cares. You know, she, she like actually means what she's saying to me, which is very, very different from most companies. Cause even if you have the right words and you technically say the right things, if I don't feel like you care or you mean it, it actually can work against you. It's like the slick used car salesman who says the right things, but you just don't feel right about it, you know, versus a more, uh, a more clumsy salesperson who kind of trips over their words. The pitch isn't perfect, but you feel like they mean it. You feel like they really, really care. And so you're inclined to look pat beyond the mistakes and uh, do business with them. That's significant, I think. How do you get people to feel to care? There's so many opinions on this topic. Uh, just the other day, I read a newsletter from a guy that said, you can't teach that. Like you, you cannot teach give a crap you know, and you can't make people care. They either have to care or they don't. I don't really agree with that. I think you can inspire people to care. Uh, and there are two ways. You can't control it, but you can inspire it. Ultimately, they do have to make their own decision. But I, uh, I've become friends with David Mead, who wrote, co-wrote the book, Find Your Why with Simon Sinek. Uh, David's an awesome guy. And last year, he shared this research study with me on leadership. They surveyed some 2,000 leaders in the construction industry and all their uh, direct reports to find out what makes a great leader. And he said, there are eight qualities that make a great leader. And at first I said, eh, I've seen enough lists of like great leadership qualities to, I think I could guess what's on it. You know, there's all the Forbes.com articles are like 10 things every great leader does, or the LinkedIn posts. Every great leader does these four things. So at first I was skeptical, but then the kicker was two of these eight leadership qualities accounted for 77% of a leader's effectiveness. The other six were like, you know, two, two to four percent apiece. And that caught my attention. I'm like, so you're telling me there are two qualities that guarantee me a C plus as a leader. The two qualities are they lead themselves effectively. So good self-discipline, basically. And they focus on others. That's it. If you want your people to care, you have two options. Number one, give them half the company because <laughs> no one's ever going to care as much as you. Give them half of your business, which I know you're not going to do that. Our option number two, demonstrate what you want to see. If you want them to care about the customer, about the job, care deeply about them. If you want them to be great listeners, listen deeply to them. It, it really, truly is as simple as modeling the behavior you want to see period. In almost every single case of a business I've ever worked with who asks me, how do I get my people to care? How do I get my people to be good at customer service? In almost every case, the leader is not demonstrating the principles they want to see their people live. And it's as simple as that. Um, you know, there's no formula. There's no secret weapon to make people care. Again, either give them half the company That'll make them care or demonstrate what you want to see, period. And that sounds simple and easy enough to do. Demonstrate that you care if you want them to care. And you're, you're right. People follow the, the behavior, the mod, they model themselves after the leader, good or bad. I recall one place I worked for where we, it was a high pressure production plant. And we were under constant pressure from our customer, so much so that we'd at one point we had daily phone calls with the customer, and we'd be sitting in the room, and and the um, the, the, the president was sitting there, and the president would be lying to the customer. Oh, and we go okay. Oh, that's <laughs> the behavior we should. That's what you want from us, <laughs> right? You just sanctioned lying. Well done. It is. Now on the company core values sheet, 
And and yeah, so any wonder that it was, uh, to say the least, it was a toxic workplace. That's such a bummer. Mm. Yeah, it's it's but, modeling the behavior you want to see. That's that's it, in my opinion. And 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 yes, and when it comes to airlines, um, I would I, I I don't know where they are now, but in my mind, uh, United is at the bottom because they're known for breaking guitars and dragging people off airplanes. <laughs> yeah, they're never going to recover from that. I mean, it's going to take a miracle. Like, yeah, and that just goes to show. People sometimes are skeptical when we talk about customer service training. Why do I need that? You know, it's not that important. It's not that big of a deal. And I say, your reputation is everything. You know, it's not about the incredible, amazing 10 star experience that makes you go viral. It's about developing a reputation for every single time we talk to the customer, we wow them. We provide unparalleled service. It's about building a reputation for that. It's not about the one-off amazing experience everyone's going to talk about for a week. It's about the reputation of consistent greatness. Because if you do not do it, if you don't have a coach who your team practices with, they're going to practice with the customer. If you do not have fundamental principles in place to help you wow the customer every time, eventually they will make a mistake perhaps something serious, like again, the United situation, and it will take you forever to recover from it. It only takes one really, really bad experience to just crush your brand's reputation. If you make a mistake, that's a different thing. If you make a small mistake and the customer gets angry and you respond well to it, that customer could actually become one of your finest, most loyal. Customers become intensely loyal to brands once they see them respond well to adversity. But that's different from, you know, dragging someone off the airplane or being downright hostile, which again, you'd be surprised how common that actually is. Uh, how most companies just kind of talk to their talk to their customers like, thank you for calling, awesome heating and air, make it quick. <laughs> you know, like, let's let's get this over with. <laughs> you mentioned that some companies have scripts and you're not a fan of them because words do matter. So, mm-hmm. so how do you guide people on what to say without necessarily tying them to a script? Excellent question. Yeah, I hate scripts. <laughs> I am I am not fond of them, but what I am fond of is uh, options. So, when we teach a customer service or even a salesperson, we teach them first of all. There are eight things you need to do on the phone. You've got to be positive or in person, whatever the interaction is. Be positive, be prepared, listen, care, focus on what you can do, ask for the business, build value before you give price, and show gratitude. If you embody those eight things, you will create a wow experience. Now, how do you do those things? It's up to you. We're going to give you the freedom to decide how to show them you're listening, how to show them that you care, how to tell them what you can do for them. Because there's an infinite number of ways you could. If I give you a script, then there's only one way to do those things. There's only one way to sound, one way to talk. And guess who doesn't care about your script? Your customer. They're not following it. you know. And if I give you a script, the customer doesn't follow it, you then lose trust in me because, oh, well, Zach's script didn't work. So rather than teach a script, we teach a set of principles, the behaviors that we want them to see see them demonstrate. And then we give them examples of how to demonstrate that behavior. On care, you could show the customer you care by saying, oh, that's terrible. I hate to hear that. That's very frustrating. Or that's exciting that you're remodeling your bathroom. Uh, Those garbage disposals, you never know how much you need them until they go out. It gives customer service and salespeople so much more freedom to be themselves. Uh, It gives them freedom to make a decision, to be autonomous, which Dan Pink tells us is one of the key things in getting people engaged is autonomy. Let them decide how to do it. Let them decide how to serve that customer. If you give them a script, you've taken away the choice. And uh, quite frankly, if you've given them a script, you might as well just have a robot do it. You're spending way more money than you need to on labor if you're just going to have them do a script. Mm, that's right. Yeah, robots can can follow the script. 
Yeah, <laughs> they already can. It's not a matter of if, it's it's here. Like, <laughs> you know, and they're not going to miss a step. Sometimes people will miss steps. Mm, mm. And robots don't get emotionally involved. Uh, the word choice, I heard the word choice in there. And I suspect that one of the challenges is that a lot of customer service people simply don't have choices. They, they haven't been given the choice by their company, by, by their employer. They've been told, do this. These are the rules. Don't break the rules. And when the customers break the rules, we punish them. <laughs> they, they don't have choices to, to move outside of this is the way our policy works. And, and do the successful companies, do, do they give customer service choices, unusual choices? The successful companies? Yeah. That's a that's a really, really thoughtful question. I would say that we they don't make it about themselves. I actually read something brilliant and interesting yesterday. I'm trying to remember the exact words, but and I believe it was Seth Godin actually, who said companies like to look in the mirror. We like to work on our appearance and how we sound and how we present things to the customer. It's about us. And if a company gives their customers lots of options, but the options are mostly about what makes life easier for the business, then you might add some level of convenience to the experience, but ultimately it's not going to connect very well because you've made it about you. You've made it about what's easy and convenient for you to do. You got to stop looking in the mirror. And you have to start looking at the market, at the customer, and you've got to base it on what is best for them. Customer obsessed. For example, I I, I mentioned the dial tree earlier. Press one for this, press two for that, press pound to speak to a representative. That is an options menu that was implemented in order to help companies, not customers. The whole purpose of the dial tree was to reduce the amount of spam calls that get through to the office, which is a company problem, and to cut costs on talking to customers who aren't qualified to be doing business with us, which again, is a company problem. In no way, shape, or form does the dial tree solve a customer's problem. All it does is create a barrier, a level of a layer of friction that the customer has to overcome to get help. So yes, Successful companies give options to their customers. You, know, you, can, you can do business with us in all these ways, but the options are based on what is truly going to benefit the customer, not what's going to make life easier for the business. Zach, your comment about companies looking in the mirror reminds me of, and, and I believe customer service for some companies, it, it, certainly one of the touch points is the website. And, and and I've looked at some websites that are clearly about the company, not about me, the customer. So when I get there, it's like how great the company is. And this is us. What else would you like to know about us? It doesn't adjust me, my issues, my priorities. And, and, and that's which tells me that or suggests how the rest of the journey is going to be. Yeah. Well, think about this podcast is called Your Intended Message, right? What is your intended message uh, is often different from your delivered message. The delivered message on the website is, like you said, it's about us. We are reliable. We are trustworthy. We've been in business since 1950. Uh, We are very experienced. We take good care of all our customers. We stand by our work. That's great. That's all about you. And that doesn't make me want to work with you. Those are the bare minimum things to make me even consider calling you. To your your intended message is you've come to the right place. You've got a problem. We can help you. Here's evidence to show that you have come to the right place. Here are the steps you as a customer need to take, and no more than three steps. Here are the steps you need to take to solve your problem with us. And here's what you can do to get started, right? It's That's what your intended message should be on the website. That's what your intended message should be when you're on the phone, when you're in a sales call conversation. It's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's about what the customer's problem is. You know what makes people pay attention more than any other thing on earth? 
when you talk about their problems. I, I could be in a total trance, daydreaming, thinking about something else. But as soon as I hear someone talk about a problem that I personally have, even if they're not talking to me, I'm paying attention. I'm listening because, oh yeah, that, I hate that. I have that problem all the time. And that's what the website should be talking about. That's what the customer service person should be talking about. The first question when you get in a customer service interaction should be, well, tell me more about your problem. What's going on? That's the intended message of customer service, of sales, of marketing, is to be about the customer and their problem. But the delivered message is often very different. It's often, we're amazing. We're great. Like you said, uh, we've been in business for a very long time. You mentioned that to me when we set up this podcast conversation that uh, most of the time people come and say, you should have me on your podcast because I, this, 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 and this, as opposed to you're a brilliant host. You ask amazing questions. Uh, Your audience believes in communication skills. And I have a topic I believe you would benefit from, right? I had a, I went through a workshop where I learned what's called the empathy test. Mm. And the empathy test is, Every time you write a message, whether an email or your website or a speech or a work presentation, okay, you are allowed to use the word I, we, no more than five times. That's it. You get five points to use I or we. Everything else needs to be you and us. So when you write, uh, and email somebody, or you craft a speech, you're going to use the eyes in the beginning with your ethos appeal, right? When you're trying to build credibility. But then beyond that, you got to be about you. You've got to be talking about them. And oftentimes, if you write a speech or if you write an email, a customer service response, a sales message, website, and you go back and read over the first draft, you'll be disgusted, disgusted at yourself with how many times you write the word I. I think, I believe, I do. It's got to be about them. That's what the empathy test is. Mm, so true. And and yes, I recently I was working with a, a marketing agency and uh, um, I I was unhappy with with the results. And, and so I I fired them. And the, the person who was working with me sent me an email that started with, I just want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> And listed a, a, a series of metrics that were apparently important to them, but did nothing for me. George, I have I have worked with so many marketing agencies, and I can't tell you how many reports I've gotten that tell me all these metrics. And meanwhile, I'm looking at leads and sales, and I'm going, "Yeah, but like, what about that? I mean, that I can't do anything. I can't do anything with impressions. I can't do anything with." likes and follows. I need customers. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, Zach, before we uh, before we wrap up, let's let people know where they can learn more about you and they can also get a hold of your newsletter, The Storytelling Habit. And that is at your website, zachgarside.com. And you can find that link in the description below. Zach, as we prepare to to wrap up, let's imagine you're talking to a business leader who is willing to take a fresh approach with the customer service of the organization. What are the one, two, or th- and if you could give them one, two, or three pieces of advice, what might that be? Where do they start? Where do they start moving? Because you can't change it in a day or even a week or a month. Where can they start? The, the organization has had poor customer service. They need to change. What do they do? Let me ask you a question and see if, if, if see if I can draw a parallel here. Uh, if you knew you wanted to improve the quality of your podcast, if you wanted to take your intended message and make the message better, what is the first thing you would do? I would talk to listeners. I would I would I would want to talk to my listeners and learn what's working for them and what do they suggest. And what, what else would you do? I'm, I'm not looking for a specific answer, by the way. I'm I'm genuinely wondering what what would you do. Um, I would listen to other podcasts and 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 learn what what's work what seems to work well there. What are they doing well? Okay, so talking to the listeners and listening to the podcast, right? To 
Because because if you're just listening to yourself, you'll notice things <laughs> that you don't like and do like. I would suggest the exact same steps to any business that wants to improve any customer facing department in their company. Sales, service, marketing. Talk to the end user, talk to the customer and listen to those recorded calls. Period. That's it. I think it's in any communication channel that we have in our company, the answer to all our problems lies with the market. Talk to them. Uh, ask them what they want, what they're struggling with. Ask about them, by the way. Don't ask about yourself. Right? Ask about them. And then review your past performance. Be an athlete. Right? Professional athletes, it doesn't matter how many years they've been doing it. They watch game film every single week. They're always trying to get better. And we should be exactly the same. We should be doing the same thing, listening to our recorded phone calls, uh, listening to our sales calls, reviewing our marketing collateral, reviewing the response to our advertising, uh, reviewing our website, and looking for what does the market, not, not what do we want to say, what does the market need to hear, and then adjusting our approach based on those factors. Powerful advice. And so powerful, Zach, that I'm tempted to to put that into practice right now and, and, and say this to the listeners. What what do you want to hear? What do you want to see differently? What's working best for you? Let me know. I want to hear from you because I'm here to serve you. My guest today is Zach Garside, reminding you to get to the fundamentals and make customer service be the voice of the organization. If you like what you heard, tell your friends and post your five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps more listeners find us. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok. Torok.